Astra just completed its first hot fire. But this is not the end, because we still have some higher targets to hit, and also a lot of questions to answer. I have several questions. Some things that immediately pop to mind after the first test are, what was the performance of the rocket? How much thrust did we get? What was the specific impulse? How did our weird bronze nozzle fare and other quirky features about the rocket? And finally, what the heck were those smoke plumes that came off the rocket at the end of the burn? That's not supposed to happen. There'll hopefully be many more hot fire burns in this propulsion testing campaign, but first we have to understand what exactly happened in the first test. Uh, everything went really well. We had good combustion. We had our grain performing properly. We also had no explosions. Oh my god! Wow! We did have one leak. Hold up, wait a minute. In the spot where we push the paraffin grain into the Pertinex insulation, we had a little bit of leakage of paraffin wax spilling into the side of the combustion chamber. Uh, the reason for that most likely is because our injector plate for our impinging injector, which is the one that we use for this test, is not quite drilled perfectly. If you look carefully, you can tell that our holes that are on the outside of this injector plate, they're a little closer to the edge on this side than they are on this side. So basically the entire thing was drilled a little bit too high. And this means that when we connect it to our bulkhead and we have our grain sitting on the opposite side, because it's not centered, it kind of has the grain sitting at a bit of an angle. And that's why we had the leakage spilling over on this face here. If you can see, that's where the paraffin was kind of shooting out of. We also decided to weigh our grain after we did the test. Uh, we started with about 2,900 grams of weight for this entire assembly and then uh, the final weight was around 2400 grams so that means that we burned about 500 grams of paraffin wax. Most of that was probably in the combustion chamber but we also did have some of it kind of getting spat out the nozzle so it might have not been a perfect combustion. If we wanted to improve that we'd probably have to change our design a little bit and include a post combustion chamber but for now we're probably going to be satisfied with slight inefficiencies uh, like this. With a mostly successful initial static fire test, we were confident to move forward with our next testing, which was a five second test. Essentially, everything would remain the same. We're just going to try and burn that grain a little bit longer to see if we can get some more interesting results. Just plugging in the igniters into our rocket. They're epoxied to the inside of the paraffin grain. And uh, it's a five minute epoxy, so we just have to hold it there for five minutes. This morning we're having some trouble with our sensors. Yesterday in our hot fire of two seconds, we had some weird readings from some of them. Specifically the pressure sensor which gave a negative pressure in the combustion chamber. What the hell? We also had some negative forces that were reported on the force plate. That would be inconceivable. Which it looks like it might have been a problem due to calibration. So we spent the whole morning uh, checking all that stuff out and now we've done a proper calibration of all of our force sensors So we're hoping we're gonna get some good force data this time and hopefully no negative pressures That burn was definitely not two seconds. Thanks, Captain Obvious. And it didn't take us too long to figure out why this was the case. While we were troubleshooting the valve and the igniter system in the morning, we actually forgot to change the timing for the valve to open for five seconds instead of two. That was the good grain in ah. <laughs> Despite the unfortunate timing mistake, how is our sensor data looking? Incorrect. All right, it's time we address the elephant in the room here. Where exactly are we getting these sensors from? Well, it turns out that we had the pleasure of having our sensors sponsored by a company called Kistler. 
They produce all types of different sensing equipment for various testing applications. And for our propulsion testing campaign, they were a perfect fit. Plus, they do make some really fancy sensors. But as is painfully obvious at this point, we kind of don't really know how to use them yet. <laughs> So we had to call in the big guns and ask for some help from the Kistler team. Even though we're just a student group, three Kistler employees actually came to help us to solve our problem. So first up, we wanted to fix the problem with these negative pressures that we were getting in the combustion chamber. We had two sensors which were recording pressures on our test stand. One of these sensors was located in front of the injector, which means it was recording the pressure at which the nitrous oxide was being fed into the combustion chamber. This one was recording positive values, no problem. But it's that pressure sensor that we put on the combustion chamber itself that was giving us the weird problems. I'm a problem child. But it turns out that after some discussion with the Kistler team, we realized what the source of the problem probably was. Because it's really hot in the combustion chamber, well, no fucking shit. it causes the sensor to go through a thermal shock, which can really adjust the baseline that the pressure sensor is set at. So instead of having its baseline reference pressure be zero, it actually ends up going really, really, really negative. Interestingly enough, the Kistler team recommended that in order to solve this problem, we actually just apply a little bit of silicon over the face of the sensor. This way, it won't be as thermally shocked by the hot combustion chamber environment. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. We had some problem with our force data. We weren't getting good force values. They were kind of all over the place. We took our force plates home. We did a little bit of uh, troubleshooting, figuring out exactly what's going on. We are now trying a different system. Before we were using that thing that looked like a flux capacitor. The flux capacitor! It was made out of aluminum, but the aluminum was probably too soft and it was deforming a bit too much, which is an issue for these pressure sensors. So instead, we have now gone to just using two steel plates. We actually cannibalized one of the steel injectors that we had that was drilled wrong. So now it's being used as a force plate. We set it up. It looks a little bit better for the force data that we're getting just by doing our calibration with weighing ourselves. So we're hoping that that will give us some slightly better results. In principle, all the three force sensors have to be summed up and when it sums up in a particular way, it, it's supposed to give you the sum of all of the values which is recorded in a virtual channel which is used on the lab amp from Kistler. Um, and what can affect these values is essentially the sensitivity value that you set up um, and any filters that you set up on the system because you're going to have a low frequency and a high frequency and of course the center part and depending on whether you set a low pass, high pass or a notch filter, the kind of data that you're gathering gets filtered out. And of course what affects the resolution is also the number of samples that you're taking per second and uh, we're trying to set an optimum value of the samples per second switching off all the filters so that we have all the data and that we're not missing out on anything. After all of our modifications to our sensor setup, we are finally ready to give this another go. Three, two, one. Unfortunately, with this test came a whole new set of problems. We were actually able to get some positive readings off of the pressure sensor in the combustion chamber, so at least we had this problem solved. The force sensor data still looked a bit messed up, but there was an even bigger problem, which is that we weren't really getting proper combustion. As is clear from the video, we were able to have a 5 second burn, but unfortunately the burn behavior was a little bit erratic. And when we looked deeper into the data, we noticed that the flow of nitrous oxide going into the combustion chamber was significantly less, actually one-fifth of the expected flow. Well, it turns out that a combination of the hot temperatures on the day and a relatively lower inlet pressure that we set combined to create what's called two-phase flow. So what this means is the nitrous oxide that's coming in yeah. through the valve is actually right near its saturation point. So it's almost like the valve is acting like an injector itself as the pressure drops as it flows quickly through the valve, you get lots of gasification and that kind of stops the flow of nitrous oxide through the system. That's why we're getting a lot less flow, that's why we're getting that low pressure behind the valve and essentially no pressure in the combustion chamber. So to stop this from happening in the future, we're deciding to up our pressure. We're not going to um, stay so close to the saturation point of the, of the nitrous oxide. All right, so it is day eight at Belgian testing in Lampelshausen 
and we are doing a slightly different setup from yesterday. We're only going to change the pressure because as we discussed before, we're not getting enough pressure to uh, get above the saturation or the vapor pressure while we're going through the valve. So the nitrous oxide is kind of turning into a gas there and is restricting our flow. So we're going to go to higher pressure. We're also uh, going to go a slightly longer burn to eight seconds because we kind of don't have time for the shorter burns anymore. So we're hoping that uh, everything will go well and this final fix will hopefully get back to the original testing which was looking really nice. Jai Riyah.